Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar that's focused on tools to support a local adoption process. My name is Misty Higgins, and I am joined by Fox DeMoise, and we are professional learning coordinators in the Division of Program Standards in the Office of Teaching and Learning. And the purpose of our time today is to assist districts in effectively selecting an approved K-3 comprehensive Tier 1 reading program to ensure that your district's adopted resource does ultimately lead to high quality instruction and improve student outcomes. Now, just a quick note, we know that there is a lot of information that's contained in today's webinar, so please know that you are going to receive a follow-up email that's going to contain links to a recording of the session and to the slide deck for later reference. And so Senate Bill 156 states that all Kentucky districts shall adopt and implement a KDE approved, valid, reliable, and standard aligned comprehensive reading program for grades K through three no later than July 1st of 2024. So today we're gonna focus on, well, what is meant by a resource being valid, reliable, and standard aligned according to the KDE, and then the tools that we have to support you in making that determination at the local level. And ultimately, this is all about strengthening tier one instruction. So we know from the research that in order to strengthen tier one instruction, there are four key actions that are focused on moving from vision to impact and improve student outcomes. So the first step is for districts to ensure that they have a common instructional vision in place for the content area. Then based on the vision, step two is to equip teachers and students with access to a strong local curriculum that's supported by high quality instruction resources, what we commonly refer to as HQIRs, that are going to provide the necessary tools to actualize your local vision. And we know that simply giving educators access to an HQIR is not enough to support them in really making the instructional shifts that are necessary to provide that vibrant student experience. So that moves us into key action three. Educators are going to need to engage in high quality curriculum based professional learning that's going to build the understanding and skills that are a part of that high quality instruction for each and every student. And when districts intentionally ensure that these pieces are in place, then we see the full impact on instruction and student outcomes. So today we're going to spend most of our time looking at those first two key actions. When thinking about an effective local adoption process, there are some essential qualities that need to be a part of that ongoing work that's going to build the necessary buy-in and ownership for actual implementation of your district selected resource. And we arrived at these essential qualities through a synthesis of the research and our experience of the past three years working with pilot districts here in Kentucky as they implemented the process that we are sharing with you today. So those essential qualities include utilizing a local selection process that is clear and inclusive, meaning that there's internal clarity into in terms of what you're doing, how you're going to do the work, and why you're choosing to do the work that way, as well as external clarity where you're being transparent to build that same understanding with your stakeholders. And the process needs to go beyond just simply being transparent about the work to also including input from stakeholders throughout. So that means your process should also be collaborative. And that collaboration should enable deeper stakeholder understanding and that sense of ownership that's going to be needed to secure commitment for actually doing the work of the process and for implementing the resource in classrooms across your district. And then finally, the process needs to be strategic and align. So really being thoughtful and intentional in how you're approaching this work and ensuring continued alignment to your district's instructional vision and the actions that are necessary to move that vision forward. So we want to pause here for just a moment, and I want you to think about prior curriculum work in your district. And which of the essential qualities that are listed there on the right-hand side of the slide have tended to be strength for your district in prior curriculum work? So take just a little time to think, and when you are ready, we would like for you to post your thoughts in the chat. So again, which of these essential qualities have tended to be strengths in prior curriculum work in your district? And collaborative straight away. <clears throat> collaborative and committed. 
strategic and aligned, collaborative mm -hmm. again, collaboration and committed again. Love we're seeing that collaboration come out. Yeah. <clears throat> Clear and inclusive, aligned and strategic. Strategic and aligned, strategic and aligned. We had a run of strategic and aligned. <laughs> <clears throat> Give just a minute for a few more to come in there. And a last note, district currently going through the HQR process and the, and the feeling that it has been strategic, but also a collaborative effort. Nice. So then here's our second question we would like for you to think about here. So which of these qualities might you want to learn more about that could help enhance curriculum work in your district, including selection of a resource? So again, which of these might help to enhance? So once again, feel free to post in the chat. We saw it, oh, an opening, pretty massive run of strategic and aligned, including one with multiple exclamation points. So, <laughs> which sounds like the support of a of an effective process could really help yes. with that. Yeah, and just it, approaching it in a systematic way that maybe yeah. hadn't been done before. Absolutely. Anything else showing up? A couple clear and inclusives, and then. The last one is looking at securing that commitment you need to um, mm -hmm. own the resource adopted and, and support yeah. implementation and other committed coming in as well. Yes, because the, the whole point of this too is to avoid adopting a resource that sits on a shelf, really making sure that it is implemented in classrooms across your district. Okay, well, thank you all for putting those in the chat. And so today we have two key tools that we want to highlight that can help ensure that you utilize a local adoption process that's going to include all of these essential qualities. So we're going to be looking at KDE's curriculum development process and then our reading and writing instructional resources consumer guide. So first, the curriculum development process is intended to guide districts through the four phases of prepare for the process, articulate instructional vision, develop the curriculum, and then implement and monitor the curriculum. We will move in a moment through these phases in a bit more detail, and we're gonna highlight key actions, products, and tools that support effective implementation for each. From research on curriculum and resource implementation and on change management, and from our experiences with the HQR pilot districts uh, and supporting this work around the state, we have really learned how vital uh, it is to be effectively in communication with and to be inclusive of stakeholder groups throughout. So toward that end, we have developed the communication plan template as a key tool within the curriculum development process. And this is the tool we're gonna to look at first today. If we consider KRS 160-345 and its shifting of authority to select a school's curriculum and instructional materials to the district superintendent, it includes consultation with the SBDM Council and the local Board of Education. And that is communication this tool is also intended to support. So clear and continuous communication throughout the curriculum process includes communication prior to formally starting the work, if possible, which is why we are thinking about it here. Ensuring stakeholders understand which content area is undergoing curriculum development during a particular year, why this is necessary, and then what the process entails. As leaders communicate with stakeholders, this should include opportunities for them to provide input to help inform the work. So the curriculum, the, the CDP communication plan template addresses key communication points for each of the four phases. So here we see an example from phase one. And if we look at the first bullet, how will we communicate the need for a revised local curriculum for the content area? You have the first part of that, of that first bullet. The table part of the tool then takes you through key communication considerations, again, from that research on effective communications within an institutional setting. So it'll help you think about the rationale and just really getting clear on why is this communication needed? What is its purpose? Then thinking about audience, with whom are we needing to communicate? And then how can we be mindful of the diverse perspectives in those different role groups we might be communicating with? Then the information or message, what is it exactly that needs to be communicated and how should that be crafted? 
then thinking about the methods of communication and which mode might be best. Is it best for this particular communication to be sent by email or as a presentation or as a webcast? Um, responsibility, who is responsible for crafting and sending the communication? And then who gathers stakeholder input and revise based on that? Um, then response, what is the allotted time frame for gathering input? And if you are seeking stakeholder input, how will that be gathered? Um, and, and last but certainly not least, those success indicators. What will determine the effectiveness of this particular communication? How will we know that it has achieved its aims? So taking up phase one of the curriculum development process now, it's really about preparing for the process and thinking through key logistics to help streamline the work and to make it more strategic and more manageable. There are three steps included in this phase, developing a timeline for the scope of the work, determining the budget, and then creating a curriculum development team that will work together through phases two and three of the process. So the curriculum development team template is a key tool from phase one, step three, and it can help you capture in an organized way who the team members are, the roles and responsibilities they represent, where they're located and grade levels they may be responsible for. And making all this visible should really help ensure there is adequate diversity of perspectives in forming the work of the team. So this artifact from the reading writing pilot is an example of the curriculum development team structure from Perry County. And as you can see, the team reflects representation from both district and school leaders, as well as classroom teachers from various grade bands across the district. So pausing here and thinking about curriculum work in your district, in addition to role groups mentioned on the previous slide, it could be important to include what other staff might also help to diversify perspectives and voices. So take a moment to consider your local context and then feel free to share in the chat. So who else might you include to really optimize diversity of perspectives for your local curriculum team? And you can just post those uh, role group names into the chat. Oh, ELL teachers, ESL mm -hmm. teacher. <clears throat> Absolutely. Reading interventionist, fanta interventionist, fantastic. Who else, given your local context, might it be really helpful to include? Anyone not mentioned yet? variety of grade level teachers and then principal coach reading interventionist and teachers yeah yeah those instructional coaches obviously can be helpful as well Wait just another second oh the public library as well as mm -hmm. um ela and coaches yeah classroom teachers and administrators okay excellent thank you so then phase two of KDE's curriculum development process provides guidance for articulating an instructional vision for the content area that's really going to serve as that instructional foundation to drive the rest of the process, including resource selection. So in phase two, step one, the first responsibility of that district curriculum team that you form is for them to engage in a collaborative analysis that will be used as the basis for drafting that local instructional vision for the content area focus. So let's take just a moment to think about, well, what is the purpose of an instructional vision? So the instructional vision is like your North Star or your guiding light. So it's what you're striving for. It focuses on the vibrant student experience that you want to see for that content area in every classroom across your district. The instructional vision also helps to ensure that everyone throughout your district is aligned to and working from a common language and a shared understanding of the observable indicators of your vision and action at the district, school, and classroom levels. It should also guide decisions regarding curriculum, instructional resources, and professional learning. So it essentially is like your gut check. Anytime you're making a decision and thinking through the lens of will this decision or action move us closer to our instructional vision. It should also be seen as a living document. So something that you would regularly revisit and update as needed. 
So when creating your instructional vision, phase two of the curriculum development process is going to point to three important lenses to focus on and ensure are reflected throughout. So lens one is to ensure that the vision is aligned to the Kentucky academic standards for the content area and the foundational beliefs that are built within those standards. Lens two is to ensure alignment to current research for teaching and learning in the content area and what has actually been shown to improve student outcomes. And then lens three is to take into account your local context, the needs of your community, and the uniqueness of your student population. Now, to help support local analysis of these three lenses, we're going to post a link in the chat to a resource that we created for our reading and writing pilot districts with this step. Um, it's going to contain a list of just some curated resources for possible use by your local curriculum team to develop that shared understanding of each lens. We also created a similar resource for our math and science pilots, and all of them spoke to how helpful this was in supporting the work at phase two. So we just wanted to make sure that we shared that with you today because it's not currently linked within the CDP document itself. So that should be in the chat for you now. And then to also help you, we have some great Kentucky specific examples of instructional visions from districts that participated in our reading and writing pilot. And as you can see from the screenshots here on the slide, there really is no one right format or organization. It's about determining as a district what you believe is the best way to clearly communicate all aspects of the vision to your stakeholders. And so you can access the instructional visions by going to Appendix A in the Curriculum Development Process document, which contains a, cool, or a toolkit of additional resources to support each phase of the process. And in the Phase 2 toolkit, you can access those instructional visions under the Sample Artifacts column. And just know when you get access to this slide deck, all, we have links in here for access to the Curriculum Development Process document and the Consumer Guide that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes minutes. So we do want to just do a quick check-in with the group. So where is your district in creating a local reading and writing instructional vision? So looking at the options that are listed there on the right-hand side of the slide, which one best represents your district? So maybe it's a one. You don't yet have an instructional vision for reading and writing. Maybe it's a two. You're in the process of creating your reading and writing instructional vision. Or possibly it's a three that you already have an established instructional vision for reading and writing. So please take just a moment to post in the chat the number that best represents where your district is currently in regards to having a reading and writing instructional vision. And immediately lots of twos, um, a one or so, and then a few threes thus far. I love many people are in the process of doing that. Yeah. That's awesome. And as you'll find out, in some ways, you're always in the process of, of getting a draft down and then constantly revisiting and refining. <clears throat> a few more threes coming in. Love that. And we would love for you to share your instructional visions with us. Um, that could be uh, examples that we could uh, provide to the rest of the state. Anything else coming in the chat there? <clears throat> there was a lot that came in at once and it slowed a little bit. <laughs> a few twos and a couple of threes to close us out. Okay. <clears throat> So from phase two, the instructional vision then drives the work of phase three, which focuses on developing a local curriculum for the content area anchored in that district selected high quality instructional resource. Selecting resources is part of phase three, step one. And this step is where the content area consumer guides fit in. So the CDP itself focuses on general guidance, whereas the consumer guides provide more targeted support and content specific characteristics of high quality instructional resources. So to help understand what that looks like in reading and writing specifically, the first subsection of the reading and writing instructional resources consumer guide after the introduction highlights KDE's general definition of HQIRs. Then come specific markers that should be considered when selecting resources to ensure alignment to the Kentucky academic standards for reading and writing. And then equity lenses for reading and writing to help make more clear what equity could look like within the content area. 
So let's take a moment to read KDE's general definition of HQIRs before zeroing in on the first characteristic. So we'll take a moment and just give that a look. Okay, so the first characteristic of KDE's general definition looks at alignment to the standards and making sure a resource aligns with the unique dimensions and demands of our Kentucky academic standards is obviously a primary consideration. Within the subsection KDE markers of high quality reading and writing instructional resources, you're gonna find five markers. Each of them has some explanatory text, bulleted considerations, and then linked resources. So the markers include text quality and complexity, high quality text dependent questions and tasks, interdisciplinary literacy practices, research-based practices for foundational skills instruction, and then access to standards for all learners. So these markers were drafted through back and forth collaboration between KDE and Ed Reports based on the Kentucky Academic Standards for Reading and Writing and the Instructional Resources Alignment Rubric linked later in the Consumer Guide. So another pause point, considering the five markers, which one might be most needed in a resource to support literacy instruction given your local context? So think for a moment and then please post the corresponding number one through five in the chat. So which one of these as an aspect of a high quality instructional resource for reading and writing might be most needed to support literacy in your local context? Saw so two, three, five, couple of fours, three. We're we're getting a good range here. Five, lot, quite a few more fours now. <clears throat> One, five, quite a few more fours. Two, two and three. Yeah, there've been several with several. Another two. Two, four, and a string of fours. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. So the markers are gonna help us to ensure alignment to the CAS, which is the first part of KDE's definition of HQIRs. The last two bullets, culturally relevant, free from bias, and accessible for all students are addressed in the next subsection that focuses on the equity lenses and reading and writing equity look fors. To support schools and districts in selecting equitable resources, a detailed table of the equity lenses provides guidance on what to look for in reading and writing resources. For this, we partnered with leading educators to craft the specific look fors in reading and writing resources aligned to each lens. To help orient you briefly to the layout of the detailed table of the equity lenses, uh, which is linked within the consumer guide, let's take a look at this screenshot. So as we move from left to right, users will find in the first column, the five lenses themselves remain common across all content areas. As you move to the second col column, and this also will stay consistent across content areas, you're going to find a narrative description unpacking what each lens means. Then it's in the third column where things get specific to a particular content area. And then this is where it really offers what we look for in reading and writing for this particular consumer guide and in reading and writing resources themselves according to each lens. And so that brings us to the last main section of the consumer guide, which is going to outline a four step adoption process that districts can use to support selecting a primary reading and writing HQIR. And here's just kind of a visual layout of those four steps. And we're going to start by taking a closer look at the first step, determining the selection criteria that will be used to identify and evaluate potential HQIRs. So your local selection criteria should be informed by your district's reading and writing instructional vision, which is why we kind of started there earlier in the session. 
the characteristics of high quality instructional resources that are outlined in the reading and writing consumer guide that Fox spoke to just a second ago, specifically those markers and the equity lenses look for. And then it should also be informed by stakeholder input to really gain a better understanding of what each group most values in a potential resource. And then these would be synthesized into a manageable set of criteria that the district curriculum team could then develop into a tool, often something like a rubric for evaluating potential resources for alignment to your district specific criteria. And we do have some examples of what that rubric could look like uh, included in the appendix for the curriculum development process phase three. So to help with gathering that stakeholder input to inform your selection criteria, the consumer guide is going to include a tool that is called the sample stakeholder questions for reading and writing. Now, the purpose of this tool is just to help guide that input gathering um, by including some sample questions that you might ask three core stakeholder groups. So teachers, families and communities, and then students. And again, this guidance is just critically important since stakeholder input is what makes selection criteria and the selected resource that eventually follows curricular pieces that everyone owns and can commit to. So just know that some of the stakeholder questions are going to be general in nature, common across all of our content areas, and then some of the questions will be specific to reading and writing. Now, once you have finalized your selection criteria, the next two steps focus on identifying and evaluating potential HQIRs that meet those criteria. So I want you all just to think about experiences that you've had since your time in education and how uh, resources have been traditionally selected. So we want you just to consider the question that you see here. So what are some ways that instructional resources have traditionally been identified and evaluated by districts across the state? So as you have some ideas, please feel free to post those in the chat. And again, just ways that districts have traditionally identified um, and evaluated potential resources at the local level. So where did they maybe go in the past to think about potential resources to even start considering and ways that they might have evaluated those? You could also think about who was initiating those, when mm -hmm. when were they happening, where were they happening. Hexagon tool. Mm. When our MTSS guide. School level pilot programs. And when we say traditionally, depending on how long you've been in education, like I've been here for over 20 years, like what are some of the ways even in the past, like when you first came into education, you might have seen those being identified and evaluated. So teacher recommendations mm -hmm. made to district or school, um, also recommendations from a coach as well, textbook adoption community, mm -hmm. committees, samples provided by publishers. Yeah. KDE approved vendors. MTSS guidance and KDE scoring guides from long ago, but still good. <laughs> Samples evaluated by faculty and staff. Any other thoughts before we move on? Once the admin gonna... decides and decision making was not clear. Mm. And I don't know about you all, but sometimes we started by just reaching out to districts around us to see what they were even using. Any last thoughts there? School level selection via committee. Mm -hmm. And then looking at moving into professional learning aligned to curriculum and instructional frameworks. Yeah, so nice. There, yeah. <clears throat> okay, thank you all. Thank you so much. So going back to KDE's general definition of HQIRs, notice the second and the third characteristics. So in order for a resource to truly be considered high quality, it needs to be research-based and or externally validated and comprehensive to include engaging text, task, and assessments. So to help take some of the heavy lift off of districts in identifying and evaluating potential HQIRs, EdReports is now available as a primary means of external validation. Um, 
that also takes into consideration the comprehensive nature of the resource. And so in case you are not familiar with Ed Reports, they are a nonprofit organization and they're often described as like the consumer reports of instructional resources. And they publish free reviews of K-12 instructional resources, evaluating those resources against things like standards alignment, usability, and other quality criteria. Now their curriculum review teams consist of five practicing educators that are selected for their content area expertise and they reflect or reflected a range of diversity of roles, regions, and grade levels. And the reviewers spend over 150 hours evaluating each instructional resource, and every reviewer has to review every single page of the resource. And so this slide just shows you the three gateways that EdReport uses to vet K-2 reading and writing resources. And as you can see, there is very close alignment to the markers that are included in KDE's Reading and Writing Consumer Guide. So those include text quality and complexity and alignment to the standards, building knowledge with text, vocabulary, and task, and then usability, which is really focusing in on those teacher and student embedded supports um, for support and access to standards for all learners. Now, if a resource meets expectations for all three gateways, then it's considered to be green rated. And that is what KDE means when they say that a resource is um, valid, reliable, and aligned to the standards. Now, Ed Reports also evaluates all of the K-2 resources for alignment to the science of reading. You're going to be able to see how a given resource aligns to each of the five pillars for each grade level that would be included in that particular resource. So we do want to show you just a quick snapshot of their website and how you can start your navigation. So on the homepage at the top under Explore Reports, you would choose ELA. Then you can use their filters to begin the process of identifying and evaluating potential HQIRs. And in order to ensure that you are starting with resources that meet KDE's definition of HQIRs, you want to filter out to only include resources that meet expectations for both alignment and usability. So those that are considered green rated across the board. And then it's going to give you a list of all of the resources that meet that criteria. And the good news is there are several green rated options for K-3, including some that are considered open education resources, meaning that the resource itself is available for free. Now, as you review the list of green rated resources, you have a couple of options to ensure that your selection is in alignment with Senate Bill 156. So the first option is to select a green rated core comprehensive program that's going to include both the knowledge building and the foundational skills components. The second option is to choose a combination of a green rated core no foundational skills along with a green rated supplemental foundational skills program that when put together would give you that core comprehensive. The consumer guide does include a video tutorial and some other resources to support districts in navigating Ed Reports website. So once you've narrowed your list to two to four potential resources, it's important to have conversations with the different vendors of those resources. The sample HQIR vendor questions for reading and writing includes a wide range of potential questions a district might ask of HQIR vendors to make sure they are selecting the best resource according to their instructional vision and can get the support needed for effective implementation. So KRS 160 345 states there should be a reasonable review and response period for stakeholders when selecting an HQIR. So as you move into the evaluation and eventual, eventual selection of your reading writing HQIR, you will need to think through how you provide opportunities for stakeholders to give input on the two to four potential resources being considered. This includes teachers not on your district curriculum team, parents and community members, students, uh, as well as each school's SBDM and your local board of education. In speaking with our reading, writing and math pilot districts about their work around this step, some advice they would offer is to make sure you have full samples available for review so people can get a better sense of the truly comprehensive nature of the resources and of the different types of embedded supports. The districts also said it is important to have guidance available that shows how the potential resources align to the instructional vision and selection criteria. 
So this guidance might be in the form of, of written guidance or a recorded video or a person present in the space where people can come in to review the resources. Again, this is just about providing context so stakeholders can get better understanding of, of the reasoning behind potential choices. So then the final step is select HQIRs. To support this step, the consumer guide includes some decision-making options and protocols that can be used to help make that final selection. Once selected, the, the district would communicate the decision to stakeholders not directly involved in that final determination, along with the rationale for the selection and how it really does meet the criteria outlined back in step one. So pausing for some reflection here on the local selection process, within the frame of what has been shared today, what is one thing that your district has done well when selecting resources in the past? Or what is one thing you might consider doing a bit differently now? So take a moment to consider and then please post your response in the chat. So modesty aside, if you were gonna own something your district has really done well um, in resource adoption in the past, um, or if there's something you're thinking about a little bit differently now that might be improved, either or, what might those be? So run the entire process with math resource adoption. One thing done well, identify potential HQIRs. So getting that initial menu of quality resources. Opportunities for teachers to pile lessons from vendors. I like that. So getting a chance to test drive it a little bit and that got a thumbs up. <clears throat> Committee formation um, to evaluate curriculum using a rubric. <laughs> One resource in particular being named as a mistake. <clears throat> in the past, maybe not enough autonomy um, mm. and not always considering transient students. Yeah. One thing to do differently, evaluation of HQIRs. Which again, you know, as that's traditionally done and done locally, you know, the, the, the time and expertise and resources it takes to really make a thorough evaluation of quality is, 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 is tough to conduct in-house. And Fox, I just wanted to add there is maybe they're still posting in the chat. You know, we have a lot of tools to, uh, to help you with many of the things that were being named or just the overall process itself. But if for any reason you ever see something not there that would have been helpful, please let us know that because we are always trying to meet the needs of districts um, as they work through this process. Full utilization of ed reports mm. cited as a strength. Collaboration with teacher stakeholders through a, through a committee and then using ed reports for validation. Oh yeah, and articulating that instructional vision to all yes. stakeholders and allowing for stakeholders to review. Yes. Again, so that really becomes our instructional vision for what we want teaching and learning to look like in a content area. Okay, make, make sure materials are indeed HQIRs and not just popular programs. Yeah, they're, the, they're those we're familiar familiar with, their vendors we're familiar with. There are those that, you know, that certain parties like, but making sure mm -hmm. they're also high quality. You got a last thumbs up. Love and, all those. Yeah, I do, I do as well. Thank you. Okay, so thinking about next steps. And that, that we would arrive now at these particular next steps probably will make sense at this point. So bringing things together, our first recommendation, and again, to get at that clarity and inclusion needed to really enable collaboration and then ultimately commitment is to develop a district communication plan. Establishing a district curriculum team comprised of a range of stakeholder groups to undertake curriculum development, that would be the next recommendation. And again, that helps us get at inclusion and, and collaboration. Third would be coming together to draft an instructional vision for reading and writing to drive the four-step adoption process, and that, and which is the next step four. And then we move on to implementation. So if an HQIR has already been adopted, for, but for some reason, these next steps maybe are not yet in place, like establishing a curriculum team or co-creating an instructional vision, it can still be very much worthwhile to undertake them, even if you have to do that retroactively, to bring that clarity, cohesion, and commitment to implementation. 
So returning here to the from vision to impact graphic we looked at earlier, space two is access to strong local curriculum and HQIRs. If we double click on that word access here, there's a more literal or superficial level established once a curriculum has adopted a resource and has it and, and, uh, once a curriculum is adopted and its resources are available. But truer and deeper access of the kind that positively affects the quality of instruction and can improve student outcomes, that degree of access requires effective implementation and high quality curriculum based professional learning. So understanding that curriculum-based professional learning is essential to effective implementation, exploring what vendors provide, and then really putting it on them to verify the quality of those offerings would be something we would highly recommend. Okay, so tying back into the curriculum development process now, phase four comes after the local selection process and focuses on implementing and monitoring the curriculum to make necessary adjustments over time to support continuous improvement. So we've worked hard the last few years researching what makes for effective implementation and how to support high quality curriculum-based professional learning. And from that, we've developed several new resources to support districts as they implement. So in closing today, we wanna to briefly mention an upcoming opportunity to walk alongside districts, resources in hand, as you implement new reading and writing HQIRs next year. Beginning in April, we will offer 90 minute professional learning workshops every other month to provide support for all three stages of implementation for launch, early and ongoing. And this includes building capacity around resources to support implementation and curriculum based professional learning. Now each workshop will feature some new learning, some collaborative processing time and then identification of next steps. So generally this is going to allow us KDE and local districts to put our heads together to maximize the impacts of this important work. So please watch for additional information and in upcoming communications. So acknowledging a lot of information has, has just been shared. What pressing questions might we answer for you as we work toward a close today? What pressing questions might you have? And at this point, please feel free to post them in the chat because we wanted to leave a good amount of time for any questions. You can post them in the chat. You can come off of mute and ask as well. So it sounds like good news on the community of practice and no questions, love the link and resources sent at the beginning. Fox. Yes. This is Elizabeth Norris with Jackson County. Yeah. Um, previously, um, when we selected a resource, we were supposed to have the vendors complete Form B and Form M. And then we went through a SharePoint site um, and um, verified that we had gone through that process. That site is no longer available and those forms are no longer posted. Has something replaced that process? And, and I'll, I'll open that to all KDE team members on the call. Is, is there is there something in particular in place of that process now? And that procedural piece might be something we have to look into a little bit and, and respond back to, which we can certainly do. Hello, Elizabeth. Um, this is Thomas Klaus, the branch manager of the Division of Program Standards. Right now, we are we are pushing people to look through the curriculum development process, but at this time, those forms aren't needed for submission. Okay. Because there is no approved list right now. I think a clarification in that direction as well. The new law would negate the need for that, correct? Correct. Right. And, and a question, and yes, I was going to speak to that next, appreciating the, the good information, but the, the information was, was coming fairly rapidly. So yes, a recording of today's, um, today's webinar, and then also the slides will be coming to all who registered for the call. And they'll also be posted and shared out elsewhere as well. So you'll get an email with those materials, and then they'll be communicated through other channels as well. So they're widely available. 
And it looks like we're, we've, the questions have stopped coming in and we've, we've transitioned to thank yous. Any other questions before we close for today and perhaps give you a few minutes back into your day? Okay, so well, as, as we close, um, we would like to thank you for your time today and for being with us. Um, as I mentioned, a recording of the webinar and PowerPoint will be will be showing up in your inbox here shortly, and then that'll all, those will also be pushed out other places as well. If you do have any questions moving forward, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Our contact information is on the screen. Um, and otherwise, have a great rest of your day. Have a great short week for, for many of you and, and have a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. Um, and we look forward, hopefully, to partnering with you, with you in this work as we look toward beginning a community of practice in April. Bye, everyone. Thank you. <clears throat>